Luke chapter 13 is the place of our text. I want to begin reading at verse 22, and we'll read down through verse 30 of this chapter. Verse 22 is where we begin at Luke, Luke 13, 22. And he went through the cities and villages teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. Then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. When once the master of the house is risen up and has shut to the door, and you begin to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. And he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not whence you are. Then shall you begin to say, We have eaten and drunk in thy presence, and thou hast taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I know you not whence you are. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. Therefore shall be, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when ye shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrust out. And they shall come from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. And behold, there are last which shall be first and there are first which shall be last. Often we're troubled, we're also grieved over what we perceive to be the limited success that the gospel seems to have. We know that it has saving power. This we're confident of, it is the power of God unto salvation. We know that it is that incorruptible seed that regenerates has that power exclusively to regenerate that which is dead in trespasses and in sins. We rejoice that it has glorious power, not just power, but glorious power, in that in it we have been given the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. Through the gospel, in the face of Jesus Christ, this is what we received. This is what we have. And even though God has deposited this treasure, this glorious gospel in earthen vessels to proclaim it, the excellency of the power is of God. So we have no, no doubts at all about the power of the gospel. We know that it is a powerful and a glorious gospel that changes men and there is absolutely no limitation to its power. As the gospel goes forth, God does accomplish that which he pleases. And uh, we are confident of that because the scripture tells us so, and therefore we preach with confidence. It is to us an amazing fact though, that Christ's own disciples who were with him throughout his earthly ministry they were with him through those years, those three years. And they seem, having been with him, hearing him preach, who preached like no other, hearing him teach, who spoke as no other man ever spake. And yet the same thing troubled them. I say this is amazing. It's somewhat shocking to read this because we know of all of his mighty works. We know as he went from village to village, the great crowds that gathered around him and the miracles that he worked in their midst and the apparent success that the gospel had. Evidently, even as Jesus was going from village to village, the disciples could, uh, could tell that relatively few truly believed and followed on to know the Lord, to put it in the words of the prophet. 
few of them believed and began to grow in grace and in knowledge and in their faith. Now this sad truth is clearly seen in the sixth chapter of John, where we find a great multitude surrounding him, ready to make him king. They had just eaten of the loaves and of the fishes, and there were so many that you couldn't even count them. But as Jesus began to teach them things and speak of things that they consider to be hard sayings, by the time you come to the end of the chapter, there are so few left that apparently just his disciples, maybe a couple or three more, so that he turns to them and says, will you also go away? That's in John chapter six. And even before that, in the second chapter, of the Gospel of John, we read that many believed on him in Jerusalem. Many believed on him, but he did not commit himself to them because he knew what was in man, which implies we can infer from that that these didn't follow on. They didn't continue in the faith. They were just a flash in the pan. They had followed for the loaves and the fishes, apparently, or some other miracle that they had seen, and they weren't genuine. And then, of course, again, in the eighth chapter of John, you find the same thing, where Jews that believed on him, when he said, if you continue in my words, then you shall be my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And that started an argument with them, or they started an argument with him concerning being Abraham's seed, and it proves that they were false disciples. They didn't truly believe. And so it was true, and the disciples could see this as they went from place to place, knowing that they were in the very presence of the Messiah. And yet they have to ask this question, are there few that be saved, Lord? As we follow you, knowing who you are, knowing that God has sent you, are there just few that are going to be saved this painful question, this painful observation prompted this question from the disciples. In another place, one asked the question, perhaps that was the case here, likely Peter is speaking for them all as they've no doubt wondered about this, maybe discussed it among themselves. And so they ask the Lord if they're only few that are going to be saved. We know in Matthew chapter 19, when Jesus was stressing how hardly a rich man shall enter into the kingdom, how hardly a rich man shall be saved. And Peter said, who then can be saved? Kind of the same question here. And he asked it uh, in amazement. They're amazed. Well, who then can be saved? And the same amazement can be detected here in the question that they ask, Lord, are there few? Are there only going to be a few saved? Now, Jesus' answer to this question is um, actually twofold. It is yes on the one hand, and then on the other, the answer is no. It is yes, and it's no. And as we read this passage through and compare what he has to say and how he says it, we know that there are few in that compared to those that take the wide gate that leads to destruction, there are only few that enter in at the straight gate which leads to life and as Matthew says in his gospel, few there be that find it. So as he answers with that, with that statement there in verse 24, strive to enter in at the straight gate, for many shall say unto you, many shall, many I say unto you will seek to enter in and shall not be able. But if you compare that to what Matthew says, he says the same thing when he says, Few there be, few there be that find it. 
So Jesus' initial answer there is, yes, you're right, you will find life. You will be saved. Now this was true then. It has been the case in every age since and in every place, even in times when it seems like there have been abundant harvest, great harvest of souls, even perhaps in times of revivals. It was even true then. When you compare those that do not believe to those who do believe, by comparison, it's always few that believe. It's always few that are saved. But yet look at, at verse 29 and see another part of Jesus' answer to this question. He says here, and they shall come from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. Now I know that he's showing here that the Jews who thought they were first are not necessarily first and this is one thing that is being seen here. But in his answer, and when we consider in another gospel where uh, verses 20, eight and 29 are actually combined together. He says here, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrust out and they shall come from the east and from the west and from the north and the south and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. In another place, those two verses are actually combined together, the contents of them. And he says, they shall come from the north and the south and the east and the west and sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of God. In that answer, he's not saying that just few are gonna be saved. Because when we consider the seed of Abraham and how that the seed of Abraham when it's described as numerous as the stars of heaven. He's not speaking of the physical seed of Abraham. He's speaking of the spiritual seed of Abraham. All of those that believe in Christ, Abraham's seed, they are Abraham's seed, according to Galatians chapter three. And we know concerning them, they are such a great number that no man can number them. So we know that the answer that he gives is yes, if you're speaking by comparison to those that do not believe, the number is few. But when you consider that they shall come from every nation, every kindred, every tribe, and they shall come and sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, believing Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, these who died in faith, remember, in the kingdom of God. And we're commissioned to take the gospel into all the world and preach it to every creature and preach Christ knowing that he has people in all of these places, in every nation, among every tribe. Just as he could tell Paul, I have much people in this city, every missionary that goes out to preach the gospel wherever they may go on this globe, they can know the same thing. God has people there. There will be people saved. They will come to Christ. And when you consider that and realize what the prophet said concerning the house of David, he said, as the host of heaven cannot be numbered, neither the sand of the sea measured, so will I multiply the seed of David my servant and of the Levites that minister unto me. What is he saying? The seed of David, again, just as the seed of Abraham. The seed of David is Christ. And in Christ, the seed of David is going to be so numerous. I think something else is being predicted there, what we read in Revelation chapter one, that we as believers in Christ are made kings and priests unto God. That's why he says the seed of David and the seed of the Levites, he's going to multiply. 
because they're the great number of the redeemed who are all made kings and priests unto God are without number. They, uh, we can't number them. God knows them. There is a number and he knows the number. Jesus knows the number. He knows it well enough to know that in the end, he is going to save every last one of them and he's going to see the travail of his soul and is going to be satisfied. And there's not going to be one missing. And when God writes up the people, it's going to be recorded that this one and that one, they were all born in her that is born in Zion and they are all saved. They're all brought safely in. Not going to be one missing. So it is a, an exact number. But when we see the description given in scripture of how numerous the redeemed are, then we know that when Jesus says this, having just said yes, compared to those that take the broad road to destruction, those that enter into the straight, straight gate and find life are few, but yet they are many. They are many, more than you can number. If the host of heaven could be numbered or the sand of the sea, if it could be measured, then you would be able to number those that shall be saved. So it's a double answer. It's a twofold answer. It's a yes and it's a no. Yes, few will be saved. No, multitudes will be saved. So when we read how they shall come from all corners, from all nations, from all kindred. And we realize what our commission is to go and take this gospel to every nation, to every creature, preach it in every place, to every tribe, knowing that he is going to call forth his redeemed. Now these, these words, these answers that our Lord gave are um, very encouraging to us. They, they encourage us to take the gospel to every creature, knowing that he has a people, that even though it seems like few are being saved, and I realize that we're living in a time when really few are being saved. It seems like that every place where the true gospel is being preached there aren't many results. Now I know many places, they're manufacturing their own results. They are preaching a false gospel of easy believism of one brand or another, and they're producing all kinds of re results. And they're doing all kinds of things to stir up a lot of excitement. But as we survey the, the work and look at the churches and the faithful brethren that we know are truly preaching the gospel with their heart and soul, refusing to compromise it at all. And yet it seems that few are being saved. This gives us encouragement because we know that when he writes up the people, it is going to be a huge number one that we can't even imagine. And we know that we're commissioned to go forth and that God will without fail call his elect out of the world by the gospel. And so we're encouraged to go forth. And we are encouraged to be very free and liberal with this gospel, not to be of a stingy spirit, but to take it literally to every creature, seeing every single one as a potential, potential convert and child of God as we go forth with the gospel. So few are saved because straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life and few there be that find it. And though many are called, the scripture says, few are chosen. And that is true in every place in every generation. As I said before, even in times when it seems like that there were, there were such greater harvest than there is now that we're experiencing. And even as I speak tonight, there are other places around the globe where it seems like there 
there is a greater harvest than there is that is per capita than there is here in, in America. So it's not like the gospel has lost its power. It is a matter of the Spirit of God taking that gospel and making it effectual in the hearts of his people. We long to see souls saved. That is one of the main reasons that we have the convocation every year. We pray for an outpouring of the Spirit. We pray that God will once more send forth his mighty gospel and bless it to the salvation of multitudes of people. I yearn to see that. I long to see it. I pray for that every day of my life. I may not ever see it. It could be that we are coming to the end when the Lord will return and when he does return that haunting question in scripture, will he find faith in the earth? Is it going to get better? Is God going to send revival? We plead with him for it and I have to believe he will. But I know that you don't pray it down as it were. God has to freely send it because the wind bloweth where it listeth. And we can't command the Holy Spirit. But we yearn for it. And whether they're being saved by many or by few, our marching orders are the same. Go forth with this gospel. Preach it uncompromisingly. Preach it to the ends of the earth. Be free and liberal with it. And call sinners to Christ. If the Holy Spirit blesses it to bring them, we praise God for that. But we're still a savor of life unto life, death unto death, and we are still a sweet savor to God. In the faithful preaching of the gospel, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, we're still a sweet savor to God regardless of what the results are, so long as we are uncompromising and faithful in preaching the gospel. So few are saved, because straight is the gate, narrow the way, is, seems to be what Jesus is saying. Few have held the truth and been saved, relatively, in all ages. And we're not talking about just going back to the times of Christ and from that time forward, there's never, all ages, that's not what we're talking about. You can take it back all the way to the beginning. The seed of Cain, the, the posterity of Cain was so much greater than the spiritual seed. The flood, eight souls and all the masses of people that inhabited this earth before the flood, eight souls were saved. That is few. Abraham was called one man, one family, out of that heathen land, just one that God called. Israel was one nation of all of the nations of the earth. The only have I known, God said. And we know that of that nation, we're not talking about a nation of saved people. We're not talking about a nation that's filled with all believers. No, only a remnant of them were true believers. But we see in that a picture that the one nation out of all the nations, we see how that Christ's church in this world is definitely in the minority. We are a minority and we always have been and we ever shall be, that is very obvious in this world, in the life of Christ. It's not just this, but as this passage shows us, even those that profess to believe, and he puts them to the test here, even those that profess to be followers of Christ, not all of them are real, not all of them are genuine. Well, in the 12th, the very ones that are questioning him here, one of them is a devil, even of Christ's select ones. And so it tells us that among those who outwardly hold to the truth, there have always been false professors. 
There's always been, there have always been those. In New Testament days, it was true, and it's been true in every age since. Some are completely insincere. He describes them here in this passage we read. They're just absolute hypocrites. That's all they are. They thought they were first. They thought because they were Jews, they had a leg up, kind of like those Jews in, in John chapter 8. The Abraham seed, we're it. But they shall be last. Some are deceivers because they are themselves deceived. They are self-deceived. Some only temporary believers. They go for a little while, look good for a while, all of a sudden they're gone. It was true then, it's true now. And many who profess to know the Lord, even some that may continue to be in church. And yet, where is the conviction? Where is the, the earnestness? Where is the sincerity in following Christ? He said to those in John chapter 8, If you continue in my words, then are you my disciples. Then are you indeed my disciples. How many true disciples are there even among those that profess to know the Lord? Now God's secret election of grace has always produced a few true followers of Christ. The sparsity of true believers should cause us to search our own hearts. Just as I believe we're bidden to do here in this passage that we read, we must examine our own zeal. We must examine our own sincerity. Strive, he said, strive to enter in at the straight gate. That sounds like strange language when we realize that salvation is all by grace, it's not by works, and yet he says, strive to enter in. But this is no contradiction. This is borne out so many places in scripture where we read of salvation by grace, but we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. The very next verse says that. And this same truth is driven home time and time and time again throughout the scriptures that there is no contradiction between receiving Christ by grace being saved through faith which is God's gift and yet ourselves having put in our souls having had put in our souls this desire to press on to strive for God's kingdom and to strive to enter into the straight gate. We don't, as many, make that decision, okay, I've got my ticket to heaven, doesn't matter now, I can just live how I want. Now that is being taught, has been for a long time, in this easy believism gospel. You just make that decision and you've got your ticket to heaven. But that's not what is taught in scripture. Those who receive Christ are those who strive for the kingdom, those who press. Paul said, I press for the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He was always pressing. Do you think God, that you believe that Paul didn't believe in salvation by grace? He preached it stronger than anybody. And yet he also preached the very same truth that James preached and that is that faith without works is dead. So we must examine our own zeal and sincerity, and we must consider our own doctrinal exactness too. It does make a difference what we believe, because he tells us to strive to enter in the straight gate. I say unto you, uh, I say unto you, I, for many I say unto you will seek to enter in and shall not be able. We are to strive for the straight 
gate. That is, doctrine, it includes doctrinal exactness, the straight gate. And this is just one of the reasons why it's called the straight gate. And what about our own promptness in obeying the gospel? Verse 25, when once the master of the house has risen up and has shut to the door, and you begin to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us, and he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not whence you are. Now I know that perhaps tonight in this place, there are not those who are hesitating. There are not those who are hanging out, standing back. I trust that we've entered in. We've striven to enter in and we've entered in at the straight gate. But how many stand back? They're not prompt about obeying the gospel. What is going to happen? Well, we see how the Lord describes it here. After it's too late, I know not whence you are, he says. When the master shuts the door, that door is shut. Now we must not do what many do and mistake outward privilege for inward grace. As he says here in verse 26, then shall you begin to say, we have eaten and drunk in thy presence and thou hast taught in our streets. Well, wonderful. That, that's a great privilege to have the presence of Christ and to have his word near and to have his teaching right here in our assembly. To have his teaching in our streets. That's a great privilege. But it is not inward grace. It is receiving that truth. It's believing that truth that brings us into the kingdom. We must prove our faith, that our faith is a living and not a dead faith. Verse 27, he says, and he shall say, I tell you, I know you not whence you are. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. Now we know that all of this sounds so much like what Matthew records there in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus' words there when he spoke about those who, even in the judgment, will be saying, Lord, Lord, have we not done this and that? And he'll say unto them, depart from me. I never knew you, you that work iniquity. You hear the same things here. So we do not, as many do, mistake outward privileges for inward grace or that our faith is a living faith when it is not truly a living faith. Faith without works, James says, is dead. So God says, or Jesus says, few shall be saved. We see exactly what he means. But when you tally it all up and all of his few that are all over the world, it is many. It is a great number. But God's few is enough as ultimately will be a great multitude. Let me close by reading a passage from the book of Revelation, beginning at uh, verse 9 of uh, chapter 7. Revelation 7, beginning at verse 9. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hands and cried with a loud voice, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne 
upon their faces and worship God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And he said unto, unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed the robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So the great multitude, that no man can number, from all nations, kindreds, and tongues, standing, worshiping before the throne of God and of the Lamb. So yes, he says they're few, but they are many. Thank God. I'm glad, thankful to be in that number. And I want to be in that number when the saints go marching in, don't you? Let's be liberal with this gospel, knowing that God has people everywhere and he will call them out by this gospel.